we were in the Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think good afternoon and, and welcome to the Hudson Institute. I myself am a visitor here. Uh, my name is Satu LeMay. I'm the vice president of the East West Center and senior advisor at the Center for Naval Analysis. Uh, I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate this panel with this distinguished group of experts on the Indo Pacific region. Um, uh, Nagao-san has been a real mover and shaker in his energy and enthusiasm while here at the Hudson Institute in putting together first class programs looking at uh, the region and particularly China's role in it. And today's program, Countering China in the Pacific, is very much in keeping with his, uh, the thrust of his work here at the Hudson Institute. So Nagao-san, congratulations on, on bringing this to fruition. And he's also assembled an absolutely first rate uh, group of experts uh, starting immediately from my left, in the order that they will speak, Richard Hedarian, who is um, uh, of De La Salle University, but currently at National Chengchi University in Taiwan, has just completed a new book, and he'll touch a bit on, on that. He's one of the foremost authorities on, on Southeast Asia and the Philippines, and, and particularly um, the Philippine-China relationship. Um, Dhruva Jaishankar, to his left, has just returned to Washington to become the... Uh, head of the uh, US uh, effort of the Observer Research Foundation. Um, I first met him uh, up almost now 30 years ago, I think, in Japan when you were uh, there. And so uh, um, delighted to see how you've uh, developed into an absolute first class uh, institute leader, but also a, a scholar and analyst on, on the region. And I've met today uh, Lizalette Odegaard, who's a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute. And what's terrific about having Professor Odegaard here is uh, her work, as I was doing the background work, is really picks up the US, China, and Europe thread. And I think it's particularly more salient as we look at post-Brexit UK, and we look at the role of France and other uh, European states in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and hope, look forward to hearing from her. And of course, our, uh, our chair and leader of this effort, uh, Satoru Nag Nagao. So the uh, format is very simple. We'll, uh, three of our presenters have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. They'll make their case. And then we'll go one rep through the other. And then we'll open it up for a Q&A. And uh, each of them will speak for an allotted amount of time. I'll try to catch their attention to keep them um, on schedule so that we can give maximum time to you to ask questions and make comments from the floor. With that, again, thank you for joining us. And Richard, may I invite you? Please, yes. And he's very high tech, so he has a, he has a phone keeping no, uh, track of his time. I'm trying to behave myself. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure. I hope uh, 
I'm my usual energetic uh, version. I'm still halfway into a five or six country <laughs> speaking tour right now. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, Hudson Institute. It's one of the places I love because uh, I feel I don't need to be very politically correct when it comes to discussions uh, of, of China. Uh, my experience in speaking across the region is that I have to be always much more careful about my language, like uh, sometimes you use assertiveness rather than aggression, among others. Here I feel I can be a little bit more free-flowing and a bit more myself, right? Um, and you can imagine why I'm not a very popular among some friends in Southeast Asia. I'm also very indebted to uh, Hudson Institute and of course Saturo Sun because uh, I just finished a book on Indo-Pacific. I think it's the first book on Indo-Pacific. It's around 400 pages based on 10 years of writing and experience across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, my dad comes from the Caspian region. Uh, my mom comes from Southeast Asia with some Iberian background. So more or less ethnically, I cover much of Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I've written books and written a lot about across the region. So I, I try to bring them together under the ambit of US-China competition, particularly uh, under the Trump administration and how we're gonna move forward. So we gave a presentation last year on Indo-Pacific and Southeast Asia's place in that, and that presentation we had here in Hudson really helped me uh, to put the final touches to the book. So today I'm gonna talk about what I call China's premature bid for hegemony. Again, the more politically correct term was China's inchoate hegemony. I've written for a number of think tanks on this issue, but uh, I think premature hegemony pretty much uh, puts it where I need it to uh, be put. Now, I think the question also right now is how do we preserve peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific? And this is not about confronting China per se or excluding China, but how to make sure that we manage the rise of China in ways that is mutually acceptable and mutually beneficial. Now, so this is the book. Uh, sorry, it was too fresh, so I couldn't bring copies. Maybe in early next year I can come back for a proper uh, 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 book tour on that. Now, when it comes to understanding what's happening in the Pacific, particularly in, in, in the Asia Pacific, um, I think there are two figures that help me a lot to frame the question and possible answer. Uh, one is, of course, the late Singaporean leader, Lee Kuan Yew. He was not right on everything, but I think he got China very much right. And he was the bridge between the West and the East. Uh, especially when it comes to engagement with China. And the other one is, of course, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, these are the two quotes that I think are very important for us uh, to keep in mind. You know, one of the observations that Lee Kuan Yew made, which made a huge uh, impression on me, was that the rise of China, especially for us in Southeast Asia, in the peripheries of China, is so dramatic that it's not going to only require tactical balance of power adjustment. It's going to change the system itself because of the sheer size and influence and ambition of China. And we feel that very much in Southeast Asia, that this is not just another rising power that we have to do some power balancing, that this is going to change the rules of the game. And we're beginning to feel that right now as we enter what we can call a strategic interregnum in East Asia. On the other hand, Walter Benjamin also talked about how behind every fascism, there's a failed revolution. Now, I'm not saying that China is a fascist, um, but what I'm trying to say here is that I think the confrontation and the tensions that we see today in uh, East Asia is also very much a product of our inability to create a Kantian perpetual peace through strong institutions that will preserve uh, pacifist and dialogue-based interaction. And this is where, coming from Southeast Asia, I'm also slightly critical of ASEAN, and I feel in the ASEAN we could do a much better job in ensuring that we negotiate great power relationship with much more proactiveness and, willing, and the willingness to take a little bit more risk, which we're not doing. Now, to defend the ASEAN, because I, get, I tend to get misunderstood on this issue, is that uh, in fairness to the ASEAN, it has achieved a lot. I mean, if you're familiar with Southeast Asian geopolitics, in the 1960s, uh, for instance, uh, confrontacy was the name of the game. War among a number of archipelagic and core countries of uh, ASEAN was almost inevitable in the eyes of some people. I remember uh, going through the WikiLeaks cable, and in one of the cable, I saw something very interesting that Razak senior administration in Malaysia uh, asked its foreign minister to talk to Britain, for Britain to talk to Kissinger, for Kissinger to talk to Nixon, for Nixon to talk to Marcos, the dictator of the Philippines back then, not to invade Malaysia over the Sabah issue. So in the late 1960s, the question of war among Southeast Asian countries was very much in the air. Now, 50 years forward, the notion of war or even the threat of use of war among Southeast Asian countries is almost unthinkable. And I think that's a huge achievement itself. We have established what constructivists would call a kind of a security community 
uh, among ourselves, whereby the th even the threat of use of war, despite uh, impending and lingering territorial disputes, is unthinkable. So it's not that we're short of conflicts uh, and tensions, but we're definitely not short of ways to manage dispute among ourselves. If you look at the ASEAN, it was also able to finalize a free trade agreement way ahead of the air uh, of time of schedule, the after CAPT, bringing down tariff rates to zero. And it made us so ambitious that we thought we can create an economic community by 2015, but of course, we missed the mark. But nonetheless, we move also forward quite quickly on that issue. ASEAN countries also have been effective in terms of pushing for non-traditional security cooperation, whether anti-piracy, counter-terrorism, and most recently, after the ISIS siege in Marawi in southern Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines have also been doing coordinated trilateral maritime patrols to ensure that ISIS elements will not enter, especially southern Philippines area. And then we are having also more uh, intelligence sharing and cooperation among countries. So a lot of achievements have happened here, but I think above all, what ASEAN has to offer is convening power, the ability to bring big powers together, including sometimes North Korea. If you look at the ASEAN regional forum discussions, so that they can talk. And as Winston Churchill said, better jaw-jaw than war-war, right? Um, so I think this is where ASEAN is very important. And as someone who spent some time in the Middle East, I could say that I really prefer what we have in Southeast Asia than the Game of Thrones situation they have in there. I, I think even Game of Thrones doesn't capture what's happening down there in the Persian Gulf. Nonetheless, as the playwright Arthur Miller said, uh, an era can be considered over when its basic illusions have been exhausted. I think the illusions here is that the ASEAN the effectiveness that we had in creating a security community among ourselves, smaller countries, will be also be able to be as effective in terms of socializing other great powers to internalize our principles of how to deal with our problems and interstate tensions. The reality, though, is that the ASEAN, uh, I think, has a fundamental misunderstanding of some of its own key principles. So the two key principles are mushawara and muafaqat, consultation and consensus. But in the ASEAN, our understanding of, of consensus is actually unanimity, right? If you look at it particularly on questions of security, politics, and human rights. And unanimity is a very problematic way of understanding it because A, unanimity means every country effectively has a veto power, right? And B, if you're an external power who doesn't want ASEAN to be united on an issue, whether you're China, US, or whatnot, all you need to do is to exert pressure and lean on, on one of members of the ASEAN, regardless of the degree of uh, concern of that ASEAN country in order to sabotage ASEAN unity on this issue. So let's say Cambodia or Laos are countries who have no direct interest in the South China Sea. And I don't blame them if they're sometimes you know, seen as saboteurs. Because from their point of view, why should we risk uh, you know, pissing off the Chinese, who are a major source of investments uh, and, of course, diplomatic support, when, in fact, we have nothing to do in South, East, uh, South China Sea disputes? I remember very well Prime Minister Hun Sen uh, in, in 2015, right before the Philippine Arbitration Award against China came out at The Hague. He said, said, this is a political issue. We don't want to do anything about it. So this is a problem whereby you don't have weighted majority voting as in the European Council, you don't have majority voting, you have essentially unanimity-based decision making. And in this situation, you're essentially asking for trouble. So my term for that is what I call middle institutional trap. It's like a middle income trap, or in more layman terms, a middle age trap. So the kind of decision making process that allowed the ASEAN to create peace among ourselves over the past 50 years is no longer effective in terms of creating peace among major powers. And that is also today affecting us very much. And this is very much related to the Indo-Pacific uh, discussion. Now, and this is where ASEAN is also increasingly moving from centrality to peripherality. Now, the reality is that while, while the ASEAN is struggling with asserting its centrality, China is changing the facts on the ground. Let's be very clear about that. So over the past two or three years, China's deployed surface to missiles. Uh, Admiral Davidson calls this the Great Wall of SAMs. Not only SANS, but also SAMs, surface to missiles. Electronic jamming equipment, nuclear capable bombers. The Chinese Coast Guard now is essentially the extension of the PLA Navy. We see more and more milit maritime militia forces from China pushing the envelope and engaging in aggressive action across, against countries across the region. So the level of diplomatic dynamism of ASEAN is not catching up with the facts on the ground. And one of my frustrations is while we're talking about the code of conduct with China, China is changing facts on the ground on a daily basis. So while we're wasting our time in negotiations, which by the way, we're not even sure it's gonna be legally binding, we're not even gonna be sure if it's gonna be legally binding whose law, whose interpretation of international law. 
facts on the uh, ground are changing. Nonetheless, my message here is one of cautious optimism. My message is that there are at least three reasons to be skeptical about this whole conventional wisdom that Asia is gone, China's already won it. I come from the Philippines, one of our icons is Manny Pac-Man, and if I'm gonna use boxing as a kind of metaphor, I think we're just in round four, and I think this is gonna go all the way to round 12, if not more. Why? The first reason is I think America's power and the resilience of its power and influence in Asia has been underestimated. If you look at actually a uh, much more observant analysis of America's power, for instance, I, can, I think Michael Beckley has done a good job in, in, a, in a journal article on international security and his latest book, he talks about, for instance, net power. A lot of people mistakenly think China is taking over because their GDP size is so large, but the country's power is not just the gross size of your economy. It's your net power. It's your ecological resources. It's your human capital. It's the living standard of your people, how much power you can deploy, the technology you have at your disposal. And the reality is that if you look at the data over the past 20 years, you're not seeing actually much convergence between China and the United States. And by the way, US has to grow only three or 4% to match China's 7, 8, 9, 10% growth because the base of American economy is much larger. If you look at biotechnology, if you look at cutting edge technology, US is still way ahead. Now, there was a very interesting observation by people including Farid Zakaria that you know everyone is panicking about China creating one million, one million scientists per year. But the question is the quality of scientists. A lot of these people have just vocational training. Yes, China has a lot of ISI publications, but what is their citation rate? And quality very much matters when you talk about net power and competition. Now, this is very interesting. People were asked across Asia Pacific, who do you still prefer to be the world reader? Ch US still comes on top, despite the fact that there have been some doubts about the Trump administration, the unpredictability of the new, new American president. Still, the US is someone that a lot of countries in the region trust to be the leader. And for more cynical people, it's the devil we know. That's the perspective that they have. Now, interestingly, when uh, this is a survey by ICS, Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, people were asked about China's Belt and Road Initiative. Actually, majority were skeptical about this. So while formally speaking, leaders in Southeast Asia welcome China's investment, well, with the exception perhaps of Prime Minister Mahathir, and we'll talk about that later on, the reality is that behind the scenes, there's a lot of skepticism among experts, government officials, and of course, people on the ground. The other thing is, we also have to put things into context. There's a lot of criticism about President Trump supposedly you know, ditching the TPP, weakening American position in this part of the world. But for a lot of countries, I'm based partly in Taiwan, based also partly in the Philippines, for actually a lot of countries on the front line of China's assertiveness or aggression, however you want to put it, the US is actually even more reliable right now than the Obama administration. For instance, if you look at the freedom of navigation operation, they're much more regular, much more expansive. They're expand, extending to areas like the Scarborough Shoal. US sometimes use double warships. US is using more advanced warships and littoral combat ships. You're seeing more pushback. Now, despite some diplomatic tensions between countries like Philippines and the United States over the past three years under President Duterte, China leading President uh, Duterte, actually the foreign military financing from the US has increased more than double to the Philippines. Again, despite the tensions, for instance, between Philippines and US, this year alone there were 290 joint military activities between the United States and the Philippines, more than any Indo-Pacific country, more than any time in the history of Philippine-US military cooperation since the Second World War. Uh, more interestingly, you also see more presence by the US Coast Guard. Uh, we were just in Halifax Forum with Druva the other day, and I got to catch up with Admiral Schultz, who's the head of the US Coast Guard. And since last year, you know, uh, we have to acknowledge that the US Coast Guard is doing a great job of doing their own version of phone ops in the Taiwan Strait, doing more joint exercises with regional Coast Guard commands and helping capacity building among countries in Southeast Asia. These are very important things. But the second thing I have to emphasize here is that everyone talks about, oh, well, we have a dichotomy whereby China dominates economy and US dominates security. It's actually way more complicated than that. Let's look at, for instance, the frontier of geopolitical competition, which is infrastructure development. If you look at infrastructure development, especially in Southeast Asia, China is not the one leading, it's actually Japan. If you look at data, and this is where I always make this comment, China, although they're communists supposedly, they get more bang out of imaginary box sometimes. They're better salesmen than any of other democratic countries in this part of the world. So this is an interesting data by Fitch Solutions that came out, and Bloomberg made a very interesting report on that. If you look at Southeast Asia, actually Japan has more infrastructure development projects. That's on top of the fact that Japan has already been the leading source of infrastructure development and overseas development assistance in Southeast Asia. I think a lot of us are underestimating 
the, the predominance, the economic predominance of Japan in East Asia, although, of course, in terms of trade and investment flows, China has been uh, taking over over the past 15 years. And it, more importantly, if you look at key countries in Southeast Asia and countries who have disputes with China in the South China Sea, like Vietnam and like the Philippines, by far, Japan is a top investor in infrastructure. In the Philippines, for instance, out of the 10 big ticket infrastructure projects of China, not a single one has cleared the pre uh, preliminary phases. One or two has done the, uh, the Kaliwa and the Chico River Dam project, but I'm not sure $60 million is considered a big ticket project. And more than that, a lot of these projects could have immensely negative ecological impact on indigenous peoples and communities in the area. So even though there is some project and it's not really big ticket, it could be actually much more problematic and it's much more than a question of debt trap. If you look at Vietnam, it's fascinating that Japan is way ahead of China to, uh, in terms of overall investment. So you have 74 projects by by, 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 by Japan in Vietnam versus 24 uh, by Japan. And if you look at who is the rising power in Southeast Asia, without question, that is Vietnam. And Vietnam will be the ASEAN chairman next year. And they're now essentially leading the region, or at least sometimes leading the lone fight uh, in terms of uh, drawing the line in South China Sea. So that, here again, you see clearly in Vietnam uh, and in the Philippines, China is, uh, Japan is well ahead in terms of infrastructure development. But it's not only them, it's also India. I mean, Druva will talk about this, so I'm not gonna go deep into it, and he has interesting tweets about this issue. I think the role of India, and also Australia, in terms of capacity building in the region is underestimated. If you look at the efforts of quad countries in terms of providing alternative avenues for raising infrastructure capital for development projects in Southeast Asia. If you look at, for instance, Australia helping the Philippines in counter-terrorism and dealing with the ISIS threats, there are a lot of things are which are happening, which are not appreciated enough, and I'll leave that to our experts here on the ground. But the third thing is this: um, I think a lot of power, a lot of people underestimate the the struggle for autonomy and strategic astuteness of smaller countries in Southeast Asia. In fact, I'll take an issue with the with the word "small." Indonesia is 270 million people. Last time I checked, it's almost American size in terms of demographics. And in terms of GDP, Indonesia is expected to be among the top five biggest economies in the world in the next two decades, and probably even number three or four before the end of this century. It's a huge country. At some point, Indonesia may be so big that it will outgrow ASEAN. But Indonesia is not the only big country. Philippines is more than 100 million. Vietnam is more than 100 million. And these countries are going to be trillion dollar GDPs in the very much near to medium future. So. ASEAN is not really a collection of small countries. It's really a collection of highly, uh, you know, highly dynamic middle powers who could be a force on their own terms, right? Although they're going through difficult times. And if you look at countries in Southeast Asia, plus Taiwan also, of course, where they're very much at the front line, you see actually leaders of this country very astutely, you know, engaging China, but at the same time trying to preserve some room for maneuver. Case in point is Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. I interviewed him earlier this year. He's 94. I was going to turn 95 soon. Um, very lucid. He's very much on the top of his portfolio. You know, he took the fight to China on the Belt and Road issue, on the debt trap issue, and eventually he managed to get $6 billion, if I'm not mistaken, of renegotiation of the contracts with them. Now, on other issues, Vietnam is pushing for a legally binding code of conduct and pushing for more pushback uh, against uh, China in the South China Sea, or in the case of Taiwan, for instance, uh, they're very much aggressively highlighting sharp power operations, which is a completely different topic. Uh, but if you want to learn about China's sharp power operations, influence operations, I think, I think the Taiwanese are the best people to talk to. But in fairness to them, they have been pushing back, and they've been quite successful in that. And most likely, uh, Tsai Ing-wen is going to pull off a uh, uh, hurry election. Now, I'm almost done, uh, 90, 90th minute. The thing is this, what is the way forward? I think the way forward is very clear. First of all, you have to make sure that the whole discussion of the Indo-Pacific is not a euphemism for saying ASEAN is no longer relevant. That is why the ASEAN earlier this year had to uh, come up with its own outlook on the Indo-Pacific to ensure that it still has a space there. The ASEAN point of view, I think this is the average mean point of view in ASEAN is that we have to be aware of threats from China, but at the same time, we have to recognize that China is a player and China is whether we like it or not, part of the game. And engagement with China is inevitable. But the question is, how do we engage them in ways that make China more responsive to the needs and sensitivities of smaller countries? 
As for Quad countries, rather than talking about creating a counter coalition or counter alliance against China, I think it's much more important to focus on capacity building and strengthening smaller countries' ability to actually defend themselves. I think that's the best way in order to deal with the threats that is emerging from China. But at the same time, it's important that America and its key allies have more strategic presence in this part of the world. And lastly, I think in the ASEAN, as much as we want to talk about multilateralism, the reality is that the consensus-based decision-making process is essentially unanimity-based decision-making process. So I think the best way to serve multilateralism, the best way to make ASEAN more effective is actually mini-lateralism. Engagement among key countries among, uh, in, in ASEAN and engagement of quad countries with key countries within the ASEAN. Uh, and we're talking about Indonesia, we're talking about the Philippines, we're talking about Vietnam, Malaysia, and these countries. If the quad countries can have effective and institutionalized cooperation with these countries on issues whereby we have concerns with China, I think that's more than enough. You don't need to get all 10 ASEAN countries on board. And I think through minilateralism, you can eventually make ASEAN much more relevant. It's a very controversial issue, but I'll leave it there to the question and answer. So I'm one minute over time. Thank you very much. Terrific. We'll come back to that. Congratulations on your book and look forward to more on that. Let me invite Dhruva Jaishankar to uh, make his comments. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Satu. Thank you to the Hudson Institute. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Nagao for inviting me to speak on this. Um, over the last three years, I spent a lot of time crisscrossing what we now call the Indo-Pacific region, uh, from Tokyo to Taipei, from Kuala Lumpur to Colombo, from Honolulu to Hanoi, and from Perth to Port Blair. And in most of those places, I ran into Richard somewhere along the way. Um, but the, one of the things that struck me in all of these places, these capitals, these regional centers, naval bases, was that I heard very similar concerns about the rise of China. Um, of course, every country had its own priorities, its own um, its own interests. But broadly speaking, I think we could categorize them, or we could we could uh, compartmentalize them into four broad areas of shared concern. The first that had to do with the lack of transparency of decision making. Uh, China is no longer an inward-looking country; it now has global interests. It is playing a very active economic and diplomatic and security role in many different parts of the world. But for the first time in a century, we're seeing a, gl a truly global power, perhaps with the exception of the Soviet Union, uh, a truly global power that has a very close system of governance. And so even when decisions are made uh, in Beijing, uh, they're viewed with a great deal of suspicion. A second broad area of concern had to do with a lack of economic reciprocity. There was a view that China was not a market economy. Uh, it is a mercantilist uh, uh, in, in some ways uh, uh, ascribes to mercantilist policies. Um, and whether it was a lack of market access, whether it was concerns about debt, whether it was uh, issues related to contracts, this was another theme that was common in many different places. A third th theme had to do with territorial revisionism. So whether it was in the East China Sea over the Senkaku uh, Islands uh, or in the South China Sea, uh, or indeed in the Himalayas uh, between uh, China and India or China and Bhutan. Uh, we, you, in all of these places, you see China using nominally civilian tools to advance, um, uh, to advance uh, in some ways, its territorial ambitions. Um, and finally, we, saw, we, we see quite consistently, although not in all areas, a certain disrespect for international norms, whether in terms of freedom of navigation and overflight whether in terms of cybersecurity and in internet governance, or indeed whether uh, in terms of the Arctic and Antarctic treaty systems, uh, which have been a, a point of growing concern. Uh, India, where I'm from, has certain specific concerns related to China's rise. And I should say that in many ways, uh, what we are seeing uh, has been advantages, uh, not just to Chinese citizens in the sense of um, being a driver of global economic growth, lifting millions of, uh, tens of millions of people out of poverty, uh, and indeed, uh, all of us in some ways have directly or indirectly benefited from China's rise over the last few years. But nevertheless, a country like India has certain specific concerns. Uh, one, there is a large boundary dispute between the two countries. Uh, 
Uh, it's not made the news very much because it's been a largely peaceful boundary in the sense that nobody has been, uh, n there hasn't been a, a violent or, or f uh, lethal um, uh, incident on the, on the boundary for the last 40 years. Uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, just to put in some perspective, this is a boundary dispute over territory the size of Indiana. Uh, effectively, uh, China claims the entire state of India, uh, home to two million people. And so we have seen uh, run-ins uh, between Chinese and Indian patrols in 2017. There was, in fact, quite a tense standoff for two months between Indian and Chinese forces uh, at a very high altitude in, in territory disputed between China and Bhutan, in fact. Indian forces intervened to, support, uh, to, um, uh, to prevent China from building a uh, road in this disputed territory. Um, a second area of major difference between India and China has to do with the massive trade deficit between the two. Um, uh, it currently stands at about $50 billion. It's dropped from over $60 billion last year. Um, but uh, this, to put in perspective, this is about the size of India's entire defense budget. So effectively, India is paying China every year the equivalent of its entire defense budget. Um, there are many reasons for this trade deficit. Lack of Indian competitiveness has to do with uh, some of it. But we, are see we have seen a trend emerge where Indian companies, which are competitive in the United States and in Europe and in Southeast Asia, and the Middle East are not uh, able to uh, compete in the Chinese marketplace. And this has been, the, the, this is an issue that has been ra raised repeatedly by Indian industry. A third concern has to do with the Belt and Road Initiative, which India was in 2017 the first country to uh, at least diplomatically boycott. Uh, in April of 2015, 2017, uh, China organized a large Belt and Road Forum in Beijing. Uh, invited several countries, uh, many of whom, including Japan and the United States, sent delegations to this forum. Uh, India opted to not to participate in that and continues to, uh, at least officially, boycott the Belt and Road, forum, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, in fact, India spelled out a series of concerns, uh, which was not to do with Chinese investment or Chinese infrastructure per se, but rather that such investment in infrastructure was not sustainable. Uh, was not transparent in terms of its contracting, did not respect local skills and labor or environmental concerns, and did not always respect sovereignty. And these were concerns that India articulated in April of 2017, and we've seen similar language, similar concerns now echoed by many other countries subsequently. Um, uh, we see this also manifested, I mean, the concerns in some ways have played themselves out uh, in countries like Sri Lanka, uh, there are rising concerns about the sustainability of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, and of course in um, uh, concerns about port facilities that China is investing in uh, across the Indian Ocean littoral and beyond. Finally, India has concerns uh, related to global governance. Uh, Ten years ago, China, India, Russia, Brazil, and others were working together uh, to try and reform international institutions as part of what they saw as a necess necessary reforms after the global financial crisis of 2008. But in recent years, we've seen uh, under Xi Jinping, China abandoned this rhetoric of rising powers rising together, and in turn is now projecting China as a peer competitor of the United States. Um, so we're seeing now, for example, China block Indian entry into international institutions, whether the Nuclear Suppliers Group uh, or the UN Security Council and also not be particularly helpful at other forums in which the two countries are both members. So all in all, what I'm, I'm trying to, the, if there's one takeaway, it's that we're seeing a structurally more competitive relationship between India and China emerging. Um, and this uh, is unlikely to change barring some very radical transformations on the part of China, which often actually have very little to do with, with India. So what is India doing about it? And I'll just run through a few quick slides if you don't mind. Um, I don't know if, all right. I'm sorry. I think I can get by without the slides. I don't have a clicker here. Um, I think the first thing, huh, Richard hijacked me. Um, uh, a few, a few things I think that um, I think are uh, India is doing, which are, are of import, which I'll just briefly uh, outline. One is, in the last two years, since the end of 2017 or so, we've seen a major stepping up in the Indian Ocean, uh, led by the Indian Navy, but also uh, linked in some ways to, you can see trends in Indian overseas assistance, both lines of credit and grant aid. 
And uh, this includes, amongst other things, uh, India establishing um, a fusion center, an information fusion center in, in, in India to monitor traffic in the Indian Ocean region, uh, entering into a number of cooperative agreements with other countries across the Indian Ocean littoral and the United States, Japan, and others. Um, in late 2017, the Indian Navy changed its operational um, tempo. Uh, it now conducts year-round operations in seven zones across the Indian Ocean, including major choke points such as the Gulf of Aden, uh, the Straits of Malacca, uh, and uh, in and around the Straits of Madagascar. You've seen increasing interoperability. India now conducts major maritime exercises with most of the significant uh, navies across the, the Indian Ocean. Uh, these are growing in sophistication. And just to give you a few examples, India and the United States just conducted their first tri-service exercises, which was an amphibious landing for uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, you've seen the first uh, tabletop exercises involving the Quad countries, that's the United States, Japan, India, um, and uh, Australia. Uh, India also took part a little farther afield in a week-long joint sail uh, along with the United States, Japan, and the Philippines in the South China Sea. And so this is in some ways breaking new ground, at least as far as Indian sec India security posture is going. And finally, we're seeing certain capacity building efforts. And so these are just some of the areas in which India is um, uh, investing either in civilian, uh, mostly civilian, and in some cases, military infrastructure. A second broad objective is integration with Southeast Asia. Um, and India is in some ways diplomatically engaged in the form of the ASEAN-led institutions, including the East Asia Summit, which, which just took place. Uh, but uh, you're also seeing efforts at building roads and connectivity. So an India-Myanmar-Thailand trilateral friendship highway will be completed in the next year or two, which will connect India to the Thai border and from then on connect to a road that will go east to Da Nang in Vietnam. Uh, you're seeing a number of security arrangements also come up. So India and Indonesia just held their first major naval exercises. India and Vietnam uh, do not only exercises, but India also trains submarine sailors and uh, combat air pilots from Vietnam. India and Singapore have a maritime agreement. Uh, the Singaporean artillery and air force do exercises on Indian soil. So this, you're seeing in some ways a, grow, a growth of Indian security partnerships also emerging here. Um, additionally, India is also developing deeper partnerships with other powers that share its concerns about China's rise. And this includes the United States, Japan, and Australia, the so-called Quad countries, but also others such as France and even Russia. Um, and again, just to give a few other examples uh, of this, uh, we had uh, the first Malabar. These are tri uh, trilateral exercises involving the United States, Japan, and India that are held every year. For the first time, they were held under Japan's leadership in the East China Sea just a couple of months ago. Um, uh, so that's just an example in some ways of the, this growing um, uh, cooperation. Uh, India and Australia just held their first anti-submarine warfare exercises in April. Uh, you had um, the first uh, India-Japan uh, Air Force exercises and Army exercises in 2018 as well. Uh, finally, like all countries in the region, there's an element of managing relations with China, uh, managing these differences. And so you are seeing attempts at trying to shape a constructive engagement. To date, uh, the efforts have still been quite modest, uh, but this does remain a critical element. And as such, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India and President Xi Jinping have held a couple of informal summits over a couple of days, this last one uh, in India just a, few, uh, a short while ago, but uh, also in 2018 in China. So in conclusion, I, you know, what I would say is uh, these efforts that I've spelled out driven by these new security and strategic imperatives on India's part align rather well with the United States free and open Indo-Pacific strategy as it's emerging under the Trump administration. Um, in fact, I would say uh, the relationship between the United States and India is one of the few that has arguably improved uh, under, from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration, from the Obama administration, and on to the Obama administration, and now to the Trump administration. We've seen in some ways, while there have been bumps on the road, it's been a largely positive trajectory. And in, in some areas, particularly in, in terms of security in the, in the Indo-Pacific, it has arguably accelerated under the Trump administration. Um, in that sense, uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of unhappiness in New Delhi about the Trump administration calling out unfair trade practices on the part of China uh, in terms of the U.S. stepping up its security presence in the region, including in the South China Sea, uh, in terms of coordinating, improved coordination with partners, uh, including Japan, Australia, India, and several countries in Southeast Asia, and, and Richard spoke very eloquently about that. Um, and just in terms of public opinion, a survey taken in 2017 after the election of President Trump uh, 
uh, of four, this is by the Pew Research uh, Center, found that India was in fact the least anti-American country of the 40 plus countries surveyed. Uh, only 9% of Indians had an unfavorable view of the United States. So there's, there does seem to be continued uh, public support in some ways for a deepening US-India partnership in this context. I'll leave finally on so three issues that I see as slightly complicating, because uh, I think it's in, in all fairness we should uh, highlight these. One is there are some growing pains of a U.S.-India partnership, emerging U.S.-India partnership that is not a treaty alliance of the kind that the United States, and particularly the security establishment the United States, has grown accustomed to. Um, and that has led to having to create a number of India-specific carve-outs, whether they're legislative carve-outs, but it's also led to a certain other sets of difficulties. And these are being addressed slowly. For example, in uh, two agreements have been signed recently, one a logistics, a mutual logistics support agreement, uh, which has been operationalized between the US and India, and also a, a secure communications agreement, which was only just signed uh, within the last year. And these are uh, sort of uh, emblematic of the, the kinds of uh, developments taking place. But uh, the fact that it does not fit into a, a sort of a NATO-style alliance or a traditional hub-and-spoke alliance system uh, that the US has enjoyed uh, sometimes complicates uh, the relationship a little bit. Uh, secondly, there have been some differences over in the bilateral relationship. So while, while the strategic relationship seems to be go growing quite uh, healthily, uh, there are some differences that have, uh, I, I wouldn't say they've imperiled the strategic partnership, but they've certainly complicated it, and uh, particularly over trade issues. So sometimes, even though India and the United States have similar concerns about China, uh, China's unfair trade practices, that hasn't automatically led to a greater convergence between the United States and India. And finally, I think there's some differences over uh, approaching partners, and most notably over Russia. Uh, so uh, India has an older relationship with Russia. Russia remains the largest uh, provider of defense equipment to, the, to India. Uh, the United States is a, a distant second. Um, but um, I think the view in India is that there are growing concerns about the, the, the Russia-China partnership that is emerging. Uh, and the way to address that is to actually continue to engage with with Russia. Now, it's easier because India and Russia don't have these intrinsic differences, uh, but it has certainly been complicated by the fact that the US Congress has applied very stringent uh, uh, sanctions on Russia. Uh, and so that, uh, for example, India's acquisition of a major um, anti uh, anti uh, an anti-aircraft um, uh, system from Russia, the S-400, uh, threatens the possibility of US sanctions on India for this. So this, this, uh, this shows in some ways the kind of complications that may arise from these very different perspectives on, on the partnership. So let me end on that note, and, and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dhruva. And uh, we'll return to some of that, particularly the how to manage a growing U.S.-India relationship with, with um, also managing the, the India-China relationship. Uh, Lizalette Odegaard, a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute, will now speak about China-Europe, I believe, primarily, also the U.S. Thank you. Um, I will talk about whether Europe has a role to play in between U.S.-Chinese uh, strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I will argue that, indeed, Europe does have a role to play. Um, when I came here, uh, sometimes when Europe was mentioned, people would say that they, Europe just sails a, th a couple of ships through the South China Sea, and that doesn't really make a difference to anyone. And I would like to explain why I think it makes a difference um, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, to do that, I need to explain how Europe works, because that's often misunderstood here in DC, in my opinion. Either uh, people see Europe as a sort of failed attempt to be a unitary state, or it's simply seen as a multilateral institution but in reality, it's probably somewhere in between. Also in Washington, currently, there's a lot of talk about uh, the frailty of Europe and how it's disintegrating. Uh, but when you come from Europe, uh, things look very differently. Uh, and most people in Europe uh, has a sense of that, that Europe has been renewed uh, as an actor and that, indeed, it's been strengthened by recent challenges. Um, regarding traditional European core issues, such as trade, 
uh, the European institutions recently have demonstrated that they do play a key role in devising common policies for the member states, and they cannot be bypassed uh, without severe repercussions in terms of losing influence. All the member states recognize that they need to back up on these issues and have one mandate to negotiate with others if they want influence in the world, and that means that even major states such as France accept uh, a mandate that they're not always happy with on the issue of trade. But in that issue, the European institutions have a lot of power. There are other issue areas where the European Union has not traditionally played such a big role, and that would include security and defense issues in the Indo-Pacific, and also an issue like uh, how to counter Chinese industrial and, and investment policies that are seen as detrimental to Europe. But in these areas, uh, new initiatives and partnerships are emerging that allow Europe to contribute in ways that we have not seen before, despite the formal weakness of the institutions. And the way that that works is that uh, what you do in practice is that you develop a division of labor between the EU institutions and groups of member states so that the EU designs a general policy um, and then individual countries, groups of countries, have the space to translate these general policies into practical initiatives, and that's a way of getting around the fact that when you have 28, 27 member states, there will always be outliers that disagree uh, with the general line. Um, so that's a desirable division of labor because it's seen as Europe acting and not individual countries acting. And the groups that do in fact take action have greater freedom to work out initiatives that are effective and that will be followed up in practice. Such efforts have allowed Europe recently to demonstrate support for core values that are shared with the US and its Indo-Pacific allies. However, this happens from an independent position that allows Europe to align itself uh, with, with other actors on the basis of European values and priorities. For example, uh, by cooperating with multilateral institutions such as ASEAN and the Arab League, which not all of its partners agree with, and also by promoting European initiatives such as, such as the Euro-Asian Connectivity Plan that was adopted by Europe in October 2018. Now let me turn to European security initiatives in the Indo-Pacific. As we've heard from prior speakers, there is a growing strategic competition in this area between China and the US and also some US allies and partners. Um, and I, I guess essentially the concern is to try to prevent that, the, that an area like the Indian Ocean turns into uh, a, um, a, an area of conflict to the extent that the South China Sea has already become. Um, and there is a recognition that the Indian Ocean is linked uh, to, the, uh, to the other parts of the Asia-Pacific uh, in, in, in now using the term the Indo-Pacific. In this region, Europe can only have very general policies, uh, as mentioned, because uh, the institutions do not really have sovereign sovereignty to decide uh, what the member should member states should do beyond the trade issue. However, what uh, the EU has done is to uh, um, initiate a number of economic and strategic partnerships with key uh, partners that are also allies of the United States. So for example, the EU and Japan has entered into an economic partnership agreement in December 17 that sended a powerful signal against protectionism. 
And in 2018, uh, they entered a strategic partnership agreement that was signed and facilitated security cooperation between the two. The EU also has a long-standing strategic partnership with India from 2004, and from 2019, uh, this is being transformed uh, into a more uh, security-oriented partnership uh, with a focus on the Indian Ocean. The EU and Singapore have agreed on closer economic and security cooperation in 2018, including a free trade agreement, and the EU sees Singapore as a sort of link to have wider and closer uh, economic and security relationships with the, the rest of Southeast Asia. Europe has also uh, linked up with the Arab League, uh, having their first joint summit in February 19 in Egypt. Uh, this is seen as an opportunity for Europe to protect against growing Chinese-Russian influence uh, with um, an organization that, uh, that the US does not wish to address or work with. Um, so the EU seeks closer relations with Asian states that are considered compatible with European liberal economic and political values and that are also critical and concerned about uh, China's growing assertiveness in the region. In terms of security and defense in practice, um, since 2016, there has been a, a French-led effort to conduct naval diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific to, to complement the general policies of the European institutions. And since then, an increasing number of European countries have conducted maritime operations and naval diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific. Of course, such an effort takes a long time to build up. There's all sorts of challenges uh, to do this. Um, there's you know, working with new partners, for example, Denmark sent a frigate as part of a French carrier group for the first time this year. It has never performed in that function, so it takes time uh, to integrate these forces. The French carrier has not been east of India since 2002 until this year. And so the environmental conditions, uh, the winds, etc., is not known. Uh, and they have to get acquainted with that and what it means for their operations. I was deployed uh, for a month uh, with the carrier group, so I learned <laughs> in person that it means a lot. So there's those kinds of details that means that these things take time to build up. But in view of that, I would say that they have come quite far in, in making uh, an effort uh, to complement uh, the, um, the deployments of other allies in the region. The carrier group this year uh, sailed from the Mediterranean via the Suez Canal across the Indian Ocean and via the Malacca Strait uh, to Singapore a rotating cast of allied ships uh, was part of the carrier group. There was Portugal, uh, Danish contributions, the UK, Italy, Australia, and the US also participated. And so transatlantic unity concerning the French initiative was demonstrated. During the deployment, the group participated in maritime exercises with the uh, Indian, Australian, Japanese navies and also with the Egyptian Navy on the way back when the US had, let, had, had left the carrier group. Um, this uh, tour, as mentioned, en ended in Singapore, another important partner of Europe. Uh, it's an authoritarian state, but it is embedded in the US alliance system. It's an economically highly developed country and a country with links to both China and the US. Uh, and this is the kind uh, of policy line that Europe also adopts, not seeing uh, China as a wholesale enemy, but as somewhere in between a competitor and a partner. So 
This was an attempt to demonstrate that there is complementarity between the work done by European institutions with respect to the Indo-Pacific and then the work of groups of countries that happens on the ground and that is intended to, to uh, emphasize and to strengthen uh, and to secure that Europe has an actual footprint in the Indo-Pacific. Um, you could say, does this matter? But I think it's important not to see the European contribution in isolation, but see it as part of the, the efforts of India, Japan, Australia, and the US to share bases, to work together as indicated by all the joint exercises. That means that if you put all these efforts together, it's actually quite uh, a formidable or, or impressive attempt to build a sort of quasi-alliance relationship with allies and partners across the Indo-Pacific uh, in an effort to sort of push back against Chinese uh, policies that are unpopular. In Europe's case, as is the case with India, as we could see from their, uh, the explanation of India's partnerships, it does happen from an independent position. So Europe is becoming more and more aware what is in Europe's interest, and it will sort of make these efforts uh, under that heading that Europe may see certain things differently from its allies and partners. So for example, in the South China Sea sail throughs that are part of this tour, uh, Europe will not sail within 12 nautical miles of Chinese occupied features uh, because in, in Europe's view that is entering into a legal gray zone and Europe doesn't wish to do that uh, because they feel that that could give problems when arguing that Europe is for the rule of law and a rules-based order. That is different from U US policies, but essentially Europe also conducts uh, freedom of navigation operations that is supportive of the, uh, the efforts uh, of the US and other countries. So while there are differences, I would say they're minor compared to the similarities uh, in terms of objectives of these efforts. So this kind of division of labor uh, that allows Europe to, uh, to have a footprint in the Indo-Pacific, I think we will see more and more of in areas where the institutions do not have uh, much formal sovereignty. For example, the EU Commission's 10 action points of robust defense policies against unfair Chinese trade and industrial policies there you see the same kind of pattern where the European institutions provide member states with backing to adopt uh, cross-border cooperation and industrial policies to deal with China's undermining of intellectual property rights, data security, etc. cetera. Um, in making these efforts, it is important, I would argue, to coordinate initiatives between allies and partners to avoid, avoid that we work at cross purposes. For example, US participation in European naval diplomacy is a good thing. Uh, allied coordination of infrastructure projects in Asia is also important. But provided that this takes place, and I believe it does, uh, then I think this is, is quite a strong effort uh, to demonstrate to China uh, that there are common values and interests across a wide range of Indo-Pacific uh, resident powers and also external powers that are willing uh, to make an effort to push back against what is seen as an increasingly problematic uh, Chinese behavior in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Speaker is Nagasan Satoru.
Thank you very much for joining the event today. And uh, your, your participation is honorable Thanksgiving present for the Hudson Institute. Um, from now, I will make the shortest presentation in this event. So therefore, if you need to go to the restroom or the taking the coffee or snacks to prepare the Q&A session, you need to hurry. <laughs> so the title of my presentation is Strong US Policy Toward China, View from Japan. I'm Japanese, no doubt. So recently, United States has been stepping up pressure on China. The latest US national security strategy published in December 2017 state explicitly that China and Russia challenge American power. The US Defense Department's Indo-Pacific strategy also focusing on the challenge presented by China. Vice President Mike Pence's remark to Hudson Institute in October 2018, this is a picture taken by me, uh, and the uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's remarks to the Hudson Institute last month also pointed to the China threat. In January 2018, the US imposed a tariff on China. And in, in response, China imposed their own tariff on the United States, which in turn led the US to impose more tariff on China. So how should Japan view this US action? Simply put, welcome. <laughs> but recently, diplomatic relations between Japan and China have been improving. And President Xi is scheduled to make an official visit to Japan in May 2020. Thus, when we assert that Japan should welcome US toughness to China, the natural response is, why? One word, one slide policy. <laughs> so there are at least three reasons. The strategic environment has not changed. The Japanese do not trust China. And the US will win. The first is the strategic environment has not changed. Even through the Japan-China relations, has been improving since 2017. The China's military activities have not changed. For example, consider the activities of China's fighter jet. After the diplomatic relations began to improve, the number of scrambles against Chinese military aircraft decreased. However, in 2018, number of the scrambles increased again to the 638 times in 365 days. So still, Japan has too many Chinese guests to deal with. So in the last month, China made an ominous move when it invited Japanese scholar to conference and then arrest him as a spy. This is strategic environment. Secondly, the Japanese do not trust China. According to the survey by the Genron NPO since 2012, more than 80% of Japanese have held unfavorable view of China. You can see the red line. A 2019 survey by the Pew Research Center, this one, also indicates that 85% of Japanese have an unfavorable view of China. So among the countries across the world, you can compare it in this case, Japan's distrust of China is very high. 80 to 90% is crazy number in democratic country, you know. So this is another one. So, U.S. will win. Japan does not view the current U.S.-China competition as a only a short-term crisis, but rather a long-term competition to decide world dominance. And Japanese believe the U.S. will win. 
This is the first example. U.S. spend more on research and development. Research and development issue is related to the high-tech war. The U.S. still lead in GDP. This is related to the trade war. U.S. spend more on defense related to the just war. So based on current technology, economic strength, and military balance, it looks like the U.S. will win in its competition with China. In addition, the U.S. is choosing effective tactics. The U.S. appear to focusing on making China poor again because the root of the, all of the China's problem is money such as the cost of rapid military modernization and the debt trap. Thus, the trade war is the right way to deal with China. Is there a reason for Japan to be concerned? For Japan, it is logical to be on US side. But if the US-China competition escalates, is there a point at which Japan should become concerned? For example, if the U.S. makes China poor again, this could have a negative impact on Japanese companies' ability to make money in China. Thus, if Japan wished to avoid becoming a passenger on the sinking ship, it needs to reduce its economic dependence on Beijing. Japan has already started to reduce its dependence on China. For example, Many Japanese companies have relocated their factories in China to Southeast Asia or South Asia. The number of Japanese citizens living in China have been decreasing from 150,000 in 2012 to 124,000 in 2017. Meanwhile, the number of Japanese in the United States has increased from 410,000 in 2012 to 426,000 in 2017. Blue line is the Japanese stay in the United States, and red line is the Japanese stay in China. So therefore, given that for Japan, China is threat. China is not trustworthy, and China is going to be loser. For Japan, strong U.S. policy toward China is welcome, and Japan is right to be on the side of the United States. Thank you very much. Well, I think you'll, I think you'll agree that we had four terrific presentations, <laughs> and so they ran, ran a little bit over our targeted time, but that's okay. As I understand it, uh, Nagao-san, we have until 1.30 at a minimum, but maybe can slip over a few minutes if there are uh, urgent questions and comments. Ground rules are very simple. I would ask you if you have a comment, a question, to identify yourself and your affiliation, please, and to direct your comment or question to one or more of the panelists. So who'd like to open up? Sure. Let me start over here, this young, yes, young man over here, and then I'll come to the front. Please. Remember to identify yourself and your affiliation, please. Uh, my name is Lin Wing. I'm from The Voice America. I have two questions that's direct to Professor Haid Darian. Um, uh, Vietnam is assuming the chairmanship as uh, next year. It's a very, very critical moment when uh, China is fast changing the status quo in the South China Sea and the COC is underway. And I'm, my, I'm wondering how can Vietnam take advantage of this opportunity to rally uh, the ASEAN's uh, in its pushback against China's. And the second question is, I'm, I'm quite interested in your uh, uh, suggestion that there should be a mini uh, lateralism among a uh, major ASEAN member. I'm wondering how is a vi viable idea in that it can undermine the ASEAN centrality? And is there any like alternative to the consensus-based mechanism, like a portion, uh, a portioning the voting right based on the weight of each individual country? Thank, thank, thank you. you very much, Richard. That's a, the second question was the same as mine. Is which coalitions do you foresee as having the most opportunity in Southeast Asia? Because the history of coalitional security activities in Southeast Asia is mixed at best. So yeah. maybe you can address. I should respond right now. Please, yes. <laughs> 
think my jet lag is finally <laughs> setting in. I'm not 20s anymore. Uh, well, first of all, on the question of Vietnam, it's very interesting, again, at a very critical juncture. If you remember in 2010, when Vietnam last time was the ASEAN chairman, we saw two famous things, right? One, Yang Jiti saying, we are big and you're small towards our Singaporean friends and the rest of the region, and Secretary uh, Hillary uh, Clinton, yes, saying also that freedom of navigation in the South China Sea is a U.S. national interest. And then the, U the Chinese came back with the core interest debate. So 10 years ago, we saw that critical juncture. And there's a dramatic qualitative difference between China's behavior in the South China Sea in the first decade of the uh, 21st century and then after the, of Vietnam. And we saw the Scarborough Shell Crisis, Philippine Arbitration Awards. So once again, Vietnam is in that critical position. I'm very interested, I wrote something for CSIS on this issue, am I allowed to talk about other think tanks, um, about the option of legal warfare for Vietnam. Uh, I'll be very brutally honest, uh, in 2013, 14, 15, 16, we were constantly invited to Vietnam uh, as Filipinos to give ideas about our arbitration award, give you certain advice. We felt we were not, you did not, I mean, we felt there was an implicit message that we might do some parallel deal, right? And I talked to a lot of senior officials in the previous administration. They would say that the Vietnamese made us feel that they might do something. And I could notice how the Vietnamese were taking notes when we went to the nitty gritties of potential compulsory arbitration. Well, what I'm trying to say here is this. There's a lot of Philippine bashing right now with President Duterte taking a very China-leaning position. But where was the ASEAN when the Philippines was taking that position? This kind of answers your second question also, because by taking the unilateral decision of taking China to international court, the Philippines has handed the whole region, right, a huge leverage and benefit. For instance, Vietnam is right now using the Philippines' unilateral decision to take China to arbitration award to gain access for its fishermen in the Scarborough Shoal. And more importantly, your threat of legal warfare is now much more credible because the Philippines has shown that compulsory arbitration under Article 287, Annex 7 of UNCLOS actually can work. It is doable. You can take China to the court even if they don't want it. But of course, not on issues of sovereignty title claims, but on issue of maritime entitlement zones. And that's very important because when you talk about Vanguard Bank, when you talk about Chinese activities within your exclusive economic zone, you can credibly use compulsory arbitration to prove that China has no business to do there. This is a very important thing that Vietnam has to do. So by putting the issue of legal warfare on the table, you're strengthening the voice of reason and sanity and patriotism in the Philippines to remind our president to do what he's supposed to do. I remember very well in 2017, our foreign minister said something like, it is our sovereign right not to assert our sovereign right with China, right? Something along those lines. It's very important that we remind the Philippines that the arbitration award is still final and binding. It's an important issue. International community has to respect that in Chinese technically an outlaw. And now you can also use that leverage to push the envelope. Now, on the second question, the re reality is that the multilateralism is hitting a wall. Uh, we're not doing the weighted majority voting of the Europeans. We're not even doing our own ASEAN minus X formula, which worked very, very well in the case of economic negotiations. So there is a deadlock there. In, in, in cases of institutional deadlock, you have to look for alternatives. I think the Philippines unilateral decision to go for arbitration award because we felt ASEAN is not doing its job is now helping a lot of ASEAN countries. And I think unilateralism is the way forward. Now, I've talked to the senior officials in the Philippine president. I raised this issue with Prime Minister Matir. I've raised this issue with your Prime Minister office. Why not, for instance, us ASEAN claimant states have our own code of conduct? a real code of conduct, not the kind of fake code of conduct that is being negotiated. In fact, what is extremely troubling to me is that if you look at the single draft of code of conduct that the Chinese were trying to negotiate, there are two elements that make me even worried. I, I, now I don't want it to be legally binding. Mm -hmm. Because I used to say, let's push for legally binding. Otherwise, what's the added value? This is just a waste of time. Now I'm actually worried because China was demanding for two things. One, that China will exclusively share the resources in the area fisheries and oil and gas in trillions of dollars only with the countries in the region, meaning forget about ONGC, Rosneft, Shell, Chevron for future contracts. That's a very important issue. And second thing, China was effectively asking for a veto on the ability of ASEAN claimant states to conduct joint exercises with other countries, which is an intrusion into prerogative of US allies like the Philippines to do our regular Balikatan exercises in the South China Sea, not to mention with our friends in Australia, Japan and among others. So China had the audacity to push for that. Thankfully, we had sane people in Indonesia and Malaysia and others pushing back, right? But the fact that China was willing to push that argument, 
or thought that it could get away with it is a very troubling sign. So in that situation of Chinese audacity, right, and thinking that they can essentially use ASEAN right now as a shield to push out other great powers, it's very important that we look at innovative approaches. So Philippine unilateralism is now benefiting Vietnam, Malaysia too for that matter, and protecting your own interests and rights. And for that matter, minilateralism, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, at least discussing a code of conduct matters in itself. And in fairness, even Indonesia is playing an increasingly important role. They rename parts of the Natu uh, I mean, overlapping with the uh, waters of the Natuna Islands as North Natuna Sea. If you saw the, I don't know the new minister, but the former minister Susi, she did a good job blowing up boats right and left just to assert uh, the claims of Indonesia. But uh, Jokowi, well, he's kind of like a mayor president, like our president in the Philippines, but he said something interesting in the ASEAN-Australia strategic dialogue last year. He talked about why not non-claimant states of ASEAN do joint patrols in certain uh, tense areas of South China Sea to bring down tensions. Now, None of these ideas are new. None of these ideas are getting the political will they need. But just by the fact that we're throwing those ideas out, that matters. Because China will li listen to you 10 times more if you're in Indonesia rather than in Cambodia or Laos. It will listen to you way more if you're Philippines, even if you're not the president, even if you're just an analyst like me. Because while ASEAN were supposed to be all equal, the reality is that not everyone has an equal stake and not everyone has an equal weight. And if key countries in ASEAN can hold their line, that is more than enough. And ASEAN can focus on other issues where it can be more effective, because ASEAN is not only the South China Sea issue. You were next, and then this gentleman here, please. We'll try to get to as many folks as we can, but please. Thank you. I'm Jean Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I follow up with uh, Dr. Hytrandrian and then also all the uh, panelists. To follow up with you, um, what do you think the U.S. and the global community can do to participate in making the presence through the international water? Because South China Sea doesn't just belong to ASEAN. It belongs to global community. So I would wonder if India, EU, uh, Japan, Australia, and everyone mm. should just go through it and have our own code of conduct, which was the uncrossed. But we should participate and keep it and hold it high value. Um, my questions to Dr. Nagao is about the CPTPP. How, where do you see ASEAN can fit into that? And Vietnam, obviously not all ASEAN, but Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, and hopefully Indonesia would be, but the rules of it would that help to build up Vietnam and all the uh, states involved in that area. And um, for that's a, that's a lot of questions. No, no, just, that that is please. a question that I want to ask about the geopolitics because it's more than just trade or money. It's geopolitics and whether you see the IT, the digital, and also the space involved in ASEAN and Vietnam and in the countering of China. Thank you. Okay, so Nagasa, why don't you do quickly CPTPP and Richard do the specific question on what the U.S. can do, and we'll invite Lizalette and Druva to talk about the geopolitics. Because the same France, uh, it was a uh, uh, TPP issue is, uh, it is welcome, because on surface we say it, we can include China, but uh, this TPP is, real intention is exclude China. So, uh, because the China's market is very big, and we need, our own big market to deal with China. This means that TPP is effective way. So if possible, Japan want to include the United States uh, because the United States is the most important part of this economy. Uh, this is short answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagasan. Well, Richard, on the, what can the US do? Maybe we can do another uh, talk in January or February yeah. because that's a very comprehensive question, but I'll keep it very uh, short. Maybe a couple of things the U.S. can do as we go up to the Vietnam yeah. chairmanship year. Well, first of all, we're seeing our Vietnamese friends very proactive here. That encourages me. Um, well, the thing is, I think for a long time, the U.S. had this what I call impossible trinity position. I kind of get the concept from economics, which is on one hand, you have treaty alliances with the Philippines, let's say, uh, and obligations that come with it. On the other hand, you want to engage China and be friendly with them. And on the other hand, the U.S. is claiming neutrality on the status of disputed land features in the area. That is a very difficult triangle to square, right? Now we're seeing some movement. Now we can debate whether this is right or wrong, but I think 
uh, we're seeing very encouraging signs from the United States. Like, as a Filipino, for instance, I'm encouraged that, first of all, Secretary Mike Pompeo, for the first time at a very high level, came on the record in his press conference in the Philippines in, in, in March of this year, March 1 of this year, when he said that the Philippine-U.S. Mutual Defense Treaty covers, he specified, South China Sea and any attack on your vessels, personnel, and aircraft in the area. That level of clarification was non-existent in the past. During the Clinton and uh, Carter administration, we saw some senior officials making those statements, but they always mentioned Pacific. We were not, I mean, you can always debate about does that cover South China. So Secretary Mike Pompeo did a very good thing. Second thing was in June, after the Reed Bank incident, whereby a suspected Chinese militia force sunk a Filipino vessel. Almost 22 folks were killed. Uh, let's not talk about where my president was on that issue. But um, uh, Sung Kim, the ambassador of US, uh, he made it very clear that the Mutual Defense Treaty could also now apply to gray zone attacks by China. Again, that's a dramatic way forward that we did not see in the previous administration. And we're very glad that we're seeing this. Now, it's very important because December last year, Philippine Defense Secretary openly said that maybe the Mutual Defense Treaty is not useful anymore. Now the conversation is very different. I got the Defense Secretary on the record saying that maybe now we're going to talk about revising the guidelines of the Mutual Defense Treaty. This is a completely different positioning we're seeing right now. And I think the reassurance coming from the Trump administration is important. Now going back to the issue of 12 nautical miles, now it's very important that you move through the 12 nautical miles and not call it right of innocent passage. Because the moment you call it right of innocent passage, you're already recognizing that China has a land feature there. You just pass there through their face and say, that is a fake island. It doesn't count for everything. anything. You're in the high seas. Now, our European friends want to play it safe or not. Now, so now we can talk about stratified, multi-layered freedom of navigation operations. I was attacked by a lot of our Chinese friends and some American friends are working for the Chinese friends, um, Mark Valencia, uh, for saying that the Philippines uh, quadrilateral, so the quad is now just not the big boys. It's actually uh, middle powers with the quad. So the, the India, Philippines, uh, Japan, and US with it. I count that also now as freedom, uh, as access operations or freedom. So we're seeing this multi-layered and this is a great division of labor that Admiral Harris was pushing for a long time now eventually we have that. So I think we're really moving in the right direction. And you, you see, the Chinese strategy is this. They go across the region and keep on saying, this is about US and China. This is great power rival. It has nothing to do with international law. So when you have one, two, three, four, even a single or two countries from Europe coming out and saying, no, 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 no. This is not US-China competition. This is about international law and freedom of navigation. So even sending one ship, even a kind of a rudimentary access operation counts a lot. And China is not looking for coercive hegemony. China wants authority. And authority comes with trust and respect. And that's not exactly what they're getting right now with everyone pushing back, no matter how small, no matter how humble. Let me invite uh, Lizalette because it came up in the context of the European approach and also Druva to speak about the question on geopolitics. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, I think the Europeans have recognized that their interest in the South China Sea is central because it has global implications. Uh, when I meet the PLA, they are now talking about renegotiating the law of the sea mm -hmm. and it changing the rules for innocent passage. Uh, and these developments are of concern for Europeans as much as they are for anyone else because it will have global impact. And this is why Europe continues to conduct freedom of navigation operations so far, mainly led by France. The UK has also done it a lot. But in, sh in a very short time, you will see the European institutions backing up this effort to put it on more solid institutional ground and to signal that indeed it's the whole of the European Union that is backing these effort. I think that's good news. Minor differences of about 12 nautical miles within or not, I think uh, should not be focused on. I think should, the focus should be that there are joint efforts uh, that uh, works towards the same objective. With regard to IT and space, I think that's in cyber, that's extremely important focus area that we have neglected. One area is technical standards, where I think China is already implementing its standards uh, along with the Belt and Road. And I think Europe, the US, and others should work together to preserve international standards that do not follow these. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Driva. You know, uh, there's a big difference between Vietnam and the Philippines. 
Philippines is a treaty ally of the United States. Um, and Vietnam, actually, I mean, I, I sympathize with this because being from India, you know, is, is not, uh, is not. And, and I think that, that changes the dynamic. In 2016, when the, the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling was made, there was, it was interesting to observe the different reactions of different countries. And I, I know there was a big debate about it in several capitals as to how you should respond to it. And I think it was somewhat discouraging to see that uh, Australia, Japan, and to some degree the United States actually took, made firmer statements in, in support of that than Vietnam and some of the claimant states. Uh, I mean, the Philippines was in undergoing its own transition, so I think it was a slightly different in, in, in that context. But uh, it made it very hard for countries like India to say, how can we be more Catholic than the Pope in some ways on this issue? So uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone should be under illusions that uh, others will fight their battles for them. Uh, it'll have to be, for, you know, each country will have to, have to take its own. But that being said, there's a lot that all, all of these countries can do to support each other short of that. Um, and I would say three things in particular. One is sharing information amongst each other, whether it's strategic assessments at the political level or day-to-day -day intelligence sharing uh, on, on pertinent issues. The second is uh, improving interoperability. So just increasing habits of cooperation amongst the militaries to work together, whether it's in the form of exercises or, or, or other ways. And the third is actually capacity building. So you know, we know that both the Vietnam and the Philippines have a shortage of uh, capable vessels to, to under, undertake some of the operations that they would like to do. And so you see, for example, India is providing some countries in the region, including Vietnam, uh, soon with, with offshore patrol vessels. Um, and the US, Japan, in fact, is also, uh, is also providing Vietnam and the Philippines uh, with, uh, under, under the guise of law enforcement, providing them with smaller patrol vessels. So I think th these are the things that can be done in, in the short term. But I don't think anyone should be under the illusion that another country, given everyone's own domestic preoccupations, uh, will be coming to their support in the uh, during a time of crisis. Well, thanks, sir. We have three minutes, and I saw at least seven hands. So I'm going to take them in the best as I can in the order I saw them. Forgive me if I didn't see them perfectly. This gentleman here, the gentleman in the lavender shirt, and this gentleman up here. So let's try those three all at once, please, just quickly. I'm a Peter Murphy, intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, phone ops, which are already hard enough to get volunteers to come along, are an incredibly weak response to the conquest of an area twice the size of Australia. So let's say we actually get a little backbone and decide to ramp this up a bit. Uh, one excellent move would be for the overnight appearance of a joint Philippine-American brigade showing up on Scarborough Shoal. And that one ship, Chinese ship, looks at the beach and sees 5,000 personnel there that weren't there last night. Uh, that's where you get a, a red line, where you get some backbone. What is the possibility of a post-Duterte Philippine government signing off on an operation to stop the conquest of the South China Sea. Yeah, uh, well, Richard, park that for a so moment, including questions. just how far Philippines is willing to go on implementing EDCA beyond the five sites that we're currently working yeah, with your government point, on, point. and much less uh, deconflicting the claims amongst the three major claimants. Yes, sir. Uh, David Little with the media. Um, my question is, how are the respective nations viewing Hong Kong and the Uyghurs and um, how does that affect that national um, country's opinion of China? Great. Thanks very much. That will apply to all folks. And sir, you were the last question for now, unless we can run over. Yes, please. Thank you, um, Nathan Guerra, Georgetown student. Um, you mentioned mini lateralism. How would that signal? What would that signal to other ASEAN members, um, considering that ASEAN consensus? Um, would mean that they're left out? And do you think that that would actually weaken ASEAN centrality or not? OK, so you've got two specific questions, I think, addressed to you, perhaps, and then a general question about how China's behavior on the Uyghurs and on Hong Kong uh, is being refracted in the respective countries, regions, in Lisa Let's case. Richard, do you want to very quickly, please, because yeah. I want to give time. For yeah, I know. Um, I, I'll try to speak fast to cheat again. <laughs> well, I, I think I responded a while ago already on this. I think there's no mutual exclusivity between minilateral and multilateral. And I think we have to really go back to the foundations, or at least this is my position. Uh, and honestly, I think a lot of people in the ASEAN would believe that we're already in a mission creep situation. You're asking an organization, which actually has a pathetic 
bare bones of what budget of $40 million with 200 folks, right, to tackle all of these fundamental issues. I think I will call ASEAN a small and medium enterprise, you know, which, has, which is pretending to be a regionalist experience, right? So ASEAN is not Southeast Asia, and this decision has to be clear. I mean, our European folks have billions of budget and thousands of bureaucrats, and still they're getting some things wrong, right? So I think many in ASEAN might be actually happy to kind of, you know, outsource some of this issue, especially the burning issue of South China Sea to a multilateral level, right? And there's a way to work around it, whereby the ASEAN can make these general statements about the basic rules of the game, and then on the multilateral level, you'll, you'll, you'll focus more on tactical and even strategic questions of how to deal with specific China's threats in the South China Sea. So I think this is something we have to be done. On the Hong Kong issue, it's very important, as I said, in Taiwan, my understanding is, I think the president has been also open about it, President Tsai, that it really helped their case because the Kuomintang Party's fundamental argument is that engagement with China is the best way to secure the status quo for Taiwan, which is like a gray zone between independence and non-recognition by much of the world, right? Um, but what happened in Hong Kong is make it very easy for, for, for the ruling party to say that, you know, if Hong Kong is such a failure God, what will happen to us if we go under the so-called two systems? Because clearly this is war, more one China than two systems, right? And this is really helping the situation in Taiwan. In the Philippines, unfortunately, half xenophobically people say, look at it, even the Chinese don't like the Chinese, right? And then our president is trying to be more Chinese than the Chinese, right? So it really helps. And more worrying places like Indonesia, we were talking about this a while ago, the last election was really an identity politics issue. No one was talking about much about economics. The issue was Islam. And the issue was China. And the two are connected when you talk about Uyghur and Xinjiang and effectively the ethnic cleansing that is happening up there, right? And I think uh, if you talk to folks from Malaysia and, 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 and Indonesia, one of the things they always emphasize is China doesn't understand Islamic sensibilities. I mean, they're completely tone deaf with their own Muslims. But they have to learn how to deal with that when it comes. But of course, the same thing applies to the United States, but that's a different mm -hmm. question altogether. And then lastly, on the issue of, uh, of Scarborough Shoal, well, I think President Duterte himself made it clear that it's a red line if the Chinese reclaim the Scarborough Shoal. So even for someone like Duterte, right, even for someone like Duterte, that is the floor. And the Defense Secretary of the Philippines made it very clear, this is too close to us, it's unacceptable, right? So for the Philippines, that's a red line. Now the question is, how do you go beyond that? The de facto plan under the previous administration and any sane administration would be this. In an event that China wants to move in concrete materials, the Philippine Coast Guard can block them. If they shoot at our Coast Guard, then we can activate the Mutual Defense Treaty. I think the idea of doing this kind of a, a special ops, et cetera, is a little bit too fancy for a lot of policymakers. But there are some operational uh, plans that they, they, were, they were being seriously discussed. And I think Duterte essentially put that aside. Uh, but these issues could be brought back. As I say, our politics is like Latin telenovela, right? I feel more at home in Mexico than, than Malaysia. Who knows what's going to happen after President Duterte? And that's why sometimes the domestic politics is more exciting than our foreign policy. Yeah. Very briefly, I'm not, I uh, won't say much about Xinjiang, uh, except that it's getting a lot, quite a bit of coverage in the Indian media. Um, I'm not sure about the official position. On Hong Kong, I think it's somewhat different. Um, uh, India has uh, strong stakes in Hong Kong. There are a large number of Indian citizens there. India has a consulate there. So several Indian companies are based out of Hong Kong that, that work uh, across mainland China. Uh, it's a major hub. Uh, it's one of the largest trade, on its own, it's one of, Hong Kong is one of the largest trade partners of India, one of the top 10 trade partners. Um, so India does have stakes there. I think they're watching what's happening quite carefully. There had been a sort of understanding between Beijing and New Delhi that they would not, um, comment on each other's internal affairs. Mm. But we've seen in the last few months basically China walking back on that, particularly mm. with comments Kashmir. on Kashmir. So I would expect um, uh, we may see some developments in that area. That's right. Briefly on Europe, uh, again, it's an example where you won't see very general institutional policies on specific issues. But for example, there has been 18 member states signing uh, a declaration which criticizes China's treatment uh, or behavior in Xinjiang. So I would say it's the same pattern. Uh, we have general human rights policies and then a group of countries which is fairly large take action on a specific itch issue uh, to, to, to give Europe a concrete footprint. And Negansan, I think you have the last word on the last set of questions. Yeah. Is we're at uh, 135. Yeah.
Um, yeah, I need to reply about uh, Japan. Um, so uh, Japan's policy toward Hong Kong and Uyghur. So in the past, uh, Japan hesitated to intervene in the Hong Kong and Uyghur, but currently Japan has changed, is my answer, because Japanese government allow Uyghur leading people to enter Japan and say their opinion in public space recently. And yesterday, the Prime Minister Abe told the Chinese Hong Kong Minister the how important free and open Hong Kong. Mm. So the Japan is the frenemy, friendly face enemy for China, I think. So that is the current situation, and Japan is US side, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Nagasan. Uh, Thank you. You know, as always with this group, we could go on and on because their expertise and their knowledge of the region is so profound and detailed. Um, and I'm sorry that we had to compress it towards the end, but thank you for spending the afternoon here for this program at the Hudson Institute. It's been my uh, honor and pleasure to um, moderate it and chair it at the request of Nagao-san. And um, to all of the panelists, thank you. Please join me in thanking and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you so much.